Hi, my name is Jared Warneman. I am a board member for CTAM. Just want to welcome everybody to our fall virtual conference. Um, tonight's roundtable discussion will be on, on intimacy in, in theater. And uh, so I just want to do a quick introduction of our panelists. I'll start with our moderator first, uh, uh, Keely Stanley Bone. Um, she is a, uh, an educator, a, an actress, a director, um, who is who's performed on stage all over the all over the United States as, as well as in in Europe, and uh, is currently a a uh, professor at Central Michigan University, where she teaches acting, directing, stage combat, uh, dialects, uh, the whole gamut. Um, next is uh, Lane uh, Doherty. She is also an educator at Central Michigan University and is a intimacy choreographer um, who has recently completed her MFA in theater. Oh, tell me out, Elaine. Pedagogy. Thank you. <laughs> That's a, yeah. Um, she is a, she's a director at the Midland Center for the Arts in Midland, Michigan. And, uh, and a, a mother and, had, uh, and uh, has a husband who's a technical theater. Uh, so my kind of guy. Uh, <laughs> and then lastly, uh, Deb Hertzberg, who is a, uh, is based out of New York, is a, a puppeteer, a customer, and a, uh, a, uh, a, a collaborator of, of, of all things theater. So, um yeah so there we go so those are our, our panelists and i'm gonna i'm gonna turn off my camera and, and mute my mic uh one thing i will say is anybody that is has a question feel free to use that uh q a feature at the bottom of the screen we'll be monitoring that and um, we'll make sure you get your questions answered um throughout the throughout the round table and um all right i leave it up to you keely Thank you, JR. Uh, welcome, everyone. We are, as JR mentioned, uh, going to have a roundtable about a very important topic in theater. It's been an important topic for a very, very long time. It's only fairly recently. We actually are starting to codify it and, and have a system in which we have a language to talk about it. And Elaine and Deb are going to talk about it. Um, first, we're going to have Elaine. Then we're going to move into Deb, and I will have a little bit at the end, and then we'll have um, plenty of time for questions. So please do uh, put your questions into the Q&A feature, and we will field those as we go. But I would like to turn this over to Elaine, my colleague, for the first section. Yay! Thanks, Keely. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am trying, I am going to try so hard to be concise, um, but honestly, I could and have talked about this for hours. <laughs> and um, I did just complete my MFA and this is what I was studying. So I, I've written about it a lot and talked about it a lot. So I'm gonna try and stay focused. I am going to share my screen. I have some bullet point notes um, just to sort of outline what we're going to be talking about. So we're talking about something that feels like it sort of jumped onto the scene only a few years ago. It feels like suddenly it was a hot topic, but, but only very recently. And actually the, the process of creating a process for intimacy for the stage really formally began about 15 years ago. So, about that long ago, um, around 2006, uh, Tonya Sina was working to finish her MFA in theater pedagogy at Virginia Commonwealth University. She was working under David Leung, who's a world-renowned fight master. And she, like many of us, had some negative experiences as an actor dealing with stage intimacy and witnessed friends and colleagues having negative experiences surrounding stage intimacy. And she came up with the idea that perhaps these foundational principles that govern fight choreography could be 
adjusted to support a safer environment for creating stage intimacy. And as it turns out, she was very right. She just, she hit the nail right on the head. And she completed her thesis work by creating this specialization. She was the first person to do this formally. And then she spent several years, you know, really honing her process and building up that toolkit and sort of gathering people from different experiences who also saw the need for this work. In 2016, along with Alicia Rodas and Siobhan Richardson, she co-founded Intimacy Directors International. And that became the first world renowned, you know, known everywhere organization that was training people to certify them in this process, to really develop people who could do this well and who could do it in a way that was safe and effective. Um, the year after that, in 2017, Chelsea Pace and Laura Reichard formed Theatrical Intimacy Education. And they have been nonstop ever since then. And the, the biggest difference there, I think, is that intimacy directors was looking to certify people as intimacy workers. And theatrical intimacy, Chelsea very often says that they're trying to make the person in the room better at being the person in the room. They're not necessarily looking to certify people in a particular process, but to educate people so that they can be better at creating this work. Um, in 2020, just at near the beginning of this year, IDI actually dissolved and basically said that they had fulfilled their mission, which was to bring intimacy work to the forefront and to put it on everyone's radar. And they really did that. Several of the people from that organization went on to create intimacy directors and choreographers, which is a similar type of organization. And then also in 2020, in the late spring, the first ever book published on this subject came out, which is called Staging Sex by Chelsea Pace, who is the co-founder of Theatrical Intimacy. That is a great, I cannot recommend that book enough, <laughs> um, a great resource. It is very user-friendly and it walks you through the process. I mean, really step-by-step -step moves you through the process. So what I'm going to talk about is the foundational principles that make up this specialization. And there are now many organizations, groups of people who are doing this work in some form or another, and they all have slightly different vocabulary that defines how they do what they do. Um, but it really all comes down to a handful of tools. And IDI was the first to really succinctly clarify that when they came up with what they call the pillars of safe intimacy. And those pillars are what support all of the work that they do. And those pillars are these five things here, consent, communication, context, choreography, and closure. So we're gonna talk a little bit about each one. The first one, of course, is consent. This is something that shouldn't be a radical notion, but is that this work is always consent based. We have functioned, as long as there's been theater, we have functioned under the, the notion that my presence in the space is equal to my consent to doing whatever you ask of me. And actors have been conditioned to say yes. We've been taught that we need to be agreeable. We need to be easy to work with. We want to get hired again. And so we do what's asked of us without considering how that actually lands on us. So when we talk about consent, we're talking about something that can be given in any moment. I can give my consent. I can withhold my consent and say, no, thank you. And should I change my mind, I can withdraw my consent. One of the distinctions that needs to be made in the rehearsal space is the difference between permission and consent. Permission is when we flex our authoritative muscles and consent is when we flex our autonomous muscles. So if I am directing a show and I'm directing a scene with Keely and Deb, they're very good. And I say to Deb, when you say that line, I want you to take both of your hands and grab Keely's shoulders and pull her towards you until the fronts of your pelvises meet. 
I've just given her permission to do that. However, until there is a conversation between Deb who is initiating the action and Keely who is receiving the action and there is consent given, nobody should be touching anybody else. So there should be no contact until there is clear verbal consent for contact. So Keely can say, sure, that's fine with me. Yes, great, let's try it. She can give that consent. She can say, actually, I am not really comfortable with our pelvises coming together. Can we come close but not make contact? She can also say, sure, let's try it and then decide that doesn't work for her and withdraw that consent. The other thing that we don't always think about is that Deb, as the initiator of the action, can also do any of those things. We very often focus on the person who is receiving the action and don't give as much attention to the person who's initiating it. And their consent is just as important as the person who is receiving. So in the rehearsal space, we want to foster the culture of consent which means that we need to continually ask for it. We need to make sure that it's an ongoing conversation. And in asking for consent, we need to ask open-ended questions. So instead of saying, it's okay if I touch you, right? In which case I've already given you the answer I want. In my question is okay, right? Instead of that, I simply ask, may I touch you? Or, would it work for you if I touched you? Or how would you feel about me touching you? Any option that gives the other person a chance to actually communicate a genuine response rather than implying the response that you want. And then the other piece here is once boundaries are established, it is everyone else's job to respect those boundaries and to not push, to not question, to not demand explanation, but to just accept and move forward. We'll get to more of that. <laughs> okay, so then we're talking about communication and actually we're always talking about communication because if we're not openly and continuously communicating, none of this other work is gonna happen anyway. We have to constantly move the conversation forward. So in communication, we're talking about two facets here. We're talking about disclosure which is information ahead of time, and then discussion, which is happening in the, in the process. So if you are producing a show and you know that there are intimate moments in it, and there are any number of things that could be classified as intimacy, so we all have to use our own sense and judgment there. But if you have moments of intimacy, anything you know from a simple kiss or an embrace, to something like simulated sex, or maybe there is some sexual violence in a scene, whatever it is, that should be disclosed to actors, potential actors, as soon as possible. That is something that should go out with the audition notices so that people have a chance to assess what is going to be expected of them and make their own smart decision about whether or not their own personal boundaries will allow them to do that work so they know what they're getting into. And so that, you know, you as a director maybe, or as an intimacy choreographer, know that the people coming into the room are completely aware of what they're going to be asked to do eventually. So it's really just about making sure there's a lot of information being exchanged. And we don't always know right away before we get into the room, before we see the bodies together, how we want something to play out but we know sort of what we want it to read as. We know what we want it to look like maybe. Um, or we know that something specific has to happen. Those things should be disclosed ahead of time. Um, another good idea is to put together a, a simple explanation of the expectations in the rehearsal space. Um, this is something that we've done for a couple of shows now where before the first read through begins, everyone is sitting around, whoever's there, you know, already on the production team, the cast, the director, intimacy director, and we go through how this is going to work in the rehearsal process. Things like no cameras are allowed, you know, you keep your phones off, no visitors in rehearsal. Um, it, you know, safety things like you as an actor will never be alone 
with the director working on an intimate moment. There will always be another neutral party in the room. Just things that can keep the environment safe and help to diffuse the inherent power dynamics. You know, one of the reasons that actors have kept their mouths closed for so long about this is because we are not the most powerful person in the room and we're afraid of upsetting that dynamic. And part of the work here is to neutralize some of that so that everyone understands that they each have a right to speak up. When there is an issue, if there is an issue, you know, hopefully not when, but if there is an issue, there should also be a clear process in place for concern resolution. So that if someone in your cast or on the production team, whoever it might be, takes issue with something that happens in the course of the rehearsal process maybe, they know who they should go talk to about that. So an actor, depending on your organization structure, you know, if we're talking about our own university department at CMU, if, if Keely's the director and I'm the NMC director and we've got a group of actors, if they have an issue with me, they might go directly to Keely. If they have an issue with Keely, they might come to me. They might skip both of us if they don't feel good about talking to a professor who they see in a different power position and go directly to the student stage manager. Um, but you want to set up a process so that the people coming into it know how to have their concerns heard or get issues resolved. Mm, context. So everything that we do on stage, really, I mean, this applies to every single thing that we do when we're putting together a production. Everything should be done in service of the text. This is all of the acting choices, you know, the costuming, what the set looks like, everything should be a direct reaction to the story that needs to be told. Sometimes, you know, people get unnecessarily ambitious in moments of intimacy and they want to stage something that looks really cool or they're insistent that it has to be this physical action when in fact it doesn't necessarily tell the story any better. There should always be discussion about what the moment is conveying because really it's about getting information to our audience. What do they need to know once this beat is done and how are we going to make sure that that's the message they get? So when you're building the scene, you've got to keep that focus on, okay, what do I have to do here? What do these actors have to do here in order to tell this moment of the story clearly? And there are any number of ways to do that which is great because you might have a really clear picture of what you want it to look like. And then you might have an actor who's got a boundary that doesn't allow them to do that. Or they might not have boundaries, but you get the bodies in motion and it doesn't quite look like what it looked like in your head, which happens all the time. So you've got to be, you know, come into the space with plan B and plan C and have an understanding that those first choices aren't always final choices. Um, but really, in terms of the context, you know, the important thing is this, this little bit at the bottom. Nothing more, nothing less. Tell the story as cleanly as you can. I feel like I should be pausing for questions. It's like teaching on WebEx when there's silence from the class. Okay, choreography. This is where all the fun stuff happens. This is where you actually get to create the movement and do the stuff and see it happen and tell the story. So when we talk about choreographing intimacy, it really is that. It is just like you are choreographing a fight or you're choreographing a dance. It is specific and it is repeatable. It should happen the same way every time. So when we give direction in staging intimacy, it is action-based direction, not acting-based direction. So I'm not gonna say, um, you know, okay, now, now you're going to kiss and then I need you to fall onto the sofa and go at it. That, that actually, it doesn't help anybody. <laughs> it's too vague. It doesn't tell you about the storytelling. It doesn't give you specific action. 
So when we create choreography, we create it as action-based and in desexualized language. So it's never about the act, it's about the physical, the series of physical actions that have to happen in order to convey the story of the moment. So we're talking about everything from the, the power control in the moment. Who initiates contact? Does that change during the moment? How long does that moment of contact last? Does it change in the middle of it? Which word does the contact happen on? Which word do we pull apart on? All of those little details. It should be choreographed just like fight or dance. It should be specific. So we might say, you know, you get a direction that says they kiss, which is not a terribly helpful <laughs> stage direction. It's our job to figure out the story of the kiss. So it might be that, um, you know, if we have person A and person B, person B initiates and closes the distance. Um, person A reciprocates and maybe takes a little bit of the power. Person B takes the power back. After a four count, they separate, whatever that might be. But it's specific to initiation, receiving, nature of receiving, duration, all of those things. Everything is quantified so that it is work. It is specific. And all of it then, when all of those qualities are clarified, can be recorded by a stage manager. And that stage manager can have that note just like blocking and can review it and make sure that the integrity of the action is maintained the next time we get into rehearsal and we get back to that scene. Once we get costumes on people, once we get lights on, once we're running the production so that it's always happening. When the choreography happens the same way every time, we can decide that it is work and not real life. This is one of the clearest ways that we separate the character from the actor and we avoid those awkward little potential showmance moments so that we don't have the moment after the scene runs where someone thinks, oh, he, he pulled me in tighter tonight. Does that mean something? Or, oh, that kiss lasted longer than it did yesterday. Is that because she wanted to kiss me? We don't have those problems because everything goes the same way every time, okay? The other, the other piece that's on the bottom here, the use of the placeholders, I sort of showed you with my, with my hands here. Um, Chelsea at Theatrical Intimacy likes to talk about handography, which is choreography with hands. And I have used it several times and I actually find it quite useful and fun. But especially when you are staging kisses, this is a great way to stage the kiss. This is someone's face, this is someone's face. It allows those two actors to mark the kiss the timing it takes to close the space, the intensity of the contact, which way the heads tilt, when that breath happens and they come back together, when they pull apart, without having their faces on each other. It is incredibly helpful. It lets them act through the moment, figure out the best way to make it happen with their director, and then actually put the kiss in place. The placeholder is also really helpful when people are sick. I've got a cold this week. I probably shouldn't be kissing my scene partner or, you know, I'm not feeling well, whatever it might be. Who knows in these days, right? So the placeholder can be terribly handy. You can also, if you have sort of a bigger piece in a scene that you are staging separately, um, very often with intimacy, you know, you don't really need extra people in the room. So it might be a moment of a bigger scene and we're working the whole scene tonight with everybody there these two minutes with these two characters, we're gonna choreograph separately in another rehearsal. All you need to do is just get to the moment before it happens, okay? We can high five, we can fist bump, whatever, just to let us know that something happens there and then move forward. And then we can plug it in once it's choreographed. All right, last bit here is closure. And closure is another important piece that allows us to separate the personal and the professional. Closure takes many different forms. It can be something that you do individually on your own. It can be a sort of post-rehearsal ritual that you have for yourself. It can be a group ritual. Um, we did that for punk rock. That was nice. 
um, where everyone comes together after the rehearsal. It can be something as simple as self-care. You know, some people after rehearsal have to take a bath or they have to play with their beloved dog or whatever it is. But it's a, it's a way that you decompress after the rehearsal and shed the skin of the rehearsal work and step back into your life. It's also an opportunity, if you're using it as a group moment, for anyone on the production team anywhere to voice a concern. And really the idea here is that nobody walks away with additional baggage. Whatever happened gets to be put on the stage and left there and everybody walks out as themselves without worrying or wondering or um, carrying that uncertainty of a moment, whatever it might have been. So it's a way to clearly put the button on rehearsal and then allow everybody to step back into their personal life and move away from the work. This is particularly important when there's intense stuff going on in the show, um, when there is sexual violence or just violence in general, um, or when there are moments of really harsh words between characters, any of those things. It allows you to debrief, assess, acknowledge that we're all back to being our personal selves and then move out of the space without carrying it with us. Okay, I hope I didn't go too far with my time. I'm gonna turn it over to Deb. One second, there is a question for you, oh. Elaine, just before we go to Deb. The question is, is permission or consent needed to have an actor wear something like lingerie or a risque piece of clothing? And this Absolutely. is actually, yeah. yeah. So it was addressed to you, Elaine, but I know um, Deb can address yeah, it. Yeah, but too. Deb, our costumer, can talk about that too. Yeah, um, absolutely. It, yeah, it really, it really should be. If you know, for instance, that there's particularly, if there's nudity in the show, that has to be disclosed before an audition. If you know that you want, um, you know, an actor to end up in a, even just in a bathing suit, that's a big deal for people, you know, that, that should be part of the disclosure if there is um, revealing costume at play. Um, when when we did the vibrator play, the end of the show is uh, Mr. And Dr. and Mrs. Givings undressing each other. And that was part of our action breakdown was the fact that not only were they going to be wearing significantly less clothing, but they were going to be taking each other's clothing off. And so that's something that got put into the action breakdown so that the actors knew not only would you be, you know, in just your, like your union suit, but she's going to take the rest of your clothes off you. So... Yeah, absolutely. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. <laughs> Go ahead, Deb. <laughs> Thank you, Elaine, great job. Um, no, but that's a, that's a very interesting question because it happens often where we end up with actors um, uh, who might be uncomfortable with what the designer and the director have deemed appropriate for a certain moment, right? So um, I'm the costume shop supervisor at Brooklyn College, um, and I'm also a puppeteer. Uh, but in my job at Brooklyn College, oftentimes when we have actors in for fittings, uh, and we have to fit a lingerie or bathing suit or or what have you, I always have the discussion with the designer in advance and I always ask them to pull a variety of options. So we have a variety of choices that we can discuss with the actor so that we know really what that actor is comfortable with and not comfortable with. And then we can go back to the director and really have a conversation. But um, in terms of the, pr the intimacy principles that Elaine outlined, the same rules can be applied for costume. Um, as, as costume designers or wardrobe attendants, we, we see actors in, in their most vulnerable moments. They're, they're standing in front of us in their underwear, right? So we just can't assume that everybody is comfortable standing in their underwear. It's, it's, not appropriate to assume that everyone's comfortable standing in their underwear, right? And especially in a fitting, that's the time when the costumer and the actor 
are trying to develop a rapport and work together to create a character and build the, the picture of the story together. So it's critically important that everyone feels comfortable and respected and that there's a process to follow. So uh, starting with consent, uh, in terms of fittings or even at measurements, I always stand back from the actor and I say, you know, do I have your consent to touch you? Um, instead of saying, oh, you don't mind if I touch you, don't, I, don't you? You know, you don't mind. So it, it's, it's about giving the actor the autonomy to be able to say yes or no, or if they have sensitive areas, they can let you know. Uh, and, and it also lets them, let the, it lets the actor know that you as the costumer or the wardrobe attendant are, are, are there to be supportive in this relationship. So um, I always ask for consent at the top of measurements or at the beginning of a fitting. Um, communication. Communication is essential. Uh, it's important to let the actor know what you're going to do before you do it so that the actor knows where the tape measure is going to be on their body, you know, or you can communicate in a fitting where you're about to pin. So uh, an example would be, I, you know, I might stand in front of the actor and say, okay, I need to pin the center back seam of your pants. I'm just going to go behind you and pin along your buttocks. Um, uh, or um, uh, I, I need to pin along your princess seam, so I'm going to be getting very close to your bust line. Uh, and just keep that communication open throughout the entire fitting process and also when you're taking measurements so the actor knows what you're doing. Um, in terms of context, uh, this is this is really important because, especially in a fitting, when you're you're trying to collaborate with the actor in in the development of this character through the clothing that the that the actor is going to wear, right? So you know, I always like to have all of the garments displayed uh, so that we can review each piece with the actor so that they get a sense. Of, of the trajectory of their character through clothing. Uh, and, and together we can, we can determine what's this story that we're trying to tell, right? But in, in, in a more practical, uh, in more practical terms, it's also really essential for uh, period shows because oftentimes, you know, you know, we might not know, uh, actors might not know and, and some designers might not know exactly you know what what piece what garment is 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 going to be that one garment that's going to be essential for the actor in 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 clicking into that role right so so it's really important especially in period uh, shows to 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 really display those garments and to discuss what they are, why we're asking you to wear them, uh, you know, shapewear, bras, petticoats, bum bum rolls, all of these things, corsets. There's a reason why we need to have actors wear certain garments because you know it it, it could be for the particular silhouette that we're trying to create. Not necessarily that we wanna change the actor's body. It's not about you know, making anyone feel uh, inhibited about their size if we're putting you in shapewear. It has more to do with how your body will look in that period, in that particular garment. And so by supplying some context behind the clothing choices that we as costume designers have made, then it really helps the actor understand, you know, what our thinking is. Instead of saying, you know, oh, here, just throw, you know, throw that on, there's stuff in the dressing room, just go put it on and come on out. Like, like that doesn't inform anyone, right? And it just creates stress. Uh, so what are the costume pieces? Why are we wearing them? And how do they all go together? Uh, also in terms of context, this is critically important for a quick change. Quick changes backstage, uh, you know, we have to know what goes first, what goes second, why we're wearing these pieces, right? So in terms of choreography, and this is, this is most essential for quick changes, right? Um, uh, it's, it's 
it's helpful to have a private space to do a quick change, but we know that isn't always the reality backstage. So it's really important that the wardrobe attendant and the actor have a good rapport and that together with the wardrobe supervisor, they have choreographed a really terrific, uh, specific, repeatable, quick change so that the actor knows what pieces she's responsible for, the wardrobe attendant knows what pieces she's responsible for and what their choreography is for the full change. And so it will be the same night after night after night. Um, and then in, in terms of closure, um, I always find this, this is you know, a, a great thing to, to remember at the end of, let's say, uh, a quick change rehearsal or at the end of a fitting or at the end of a measurement session, you know, keep it open. You know, do you have any questions for me? Is there any, is there anything I can help you with? Um, I always remember to say thank you. Uh, and, and also I always remember to ask the actors if anything changes in rehearsal, let me know. If there are rehearsal discoveries that you find, please let me know if there's any sort of uh, choreography that might impede uh, your ability to wear these garments, please let me know. And and I find that that um, using using those phrases like that helps to sort of end the session, and then everybody seems to be able to part their own way, feeling positive and supported and reassured that team costume has your back. So so I think it's 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 marvelous to employ these principles of intimacy direction, not only for uh, directing intimacy on stage and participating in intimacy on stage, but it's it is absolutely essential for for the costumer uh, and for that costumer actor relationship. And uh, there is a question. There's a couple of questions for you. Oh, One is, um, should there be a form or something to be signed, or is it a verbal? Is a verbal consent fine? Um, this person understands the tape measure placement thing, like. Um, when you have to measure on an inseam, but I think the question basically is, should there be a form of consent or is the verbal um, exchange in that moment fine? Yeah, you know, inseam, that's, that's tricky, right? So um, how I handle it is uh, before I take the inseam measurement, I stand back and I say, um, I need to take your inseam measurement uh, here's the top of the tape measure and I hand it to the actor and I say, hold that tape measure in the top of your crotch where the seam of your pants come together. And so then the actor can put the tape measure in that place and then I can crouch down to the actor's ankle and take the measurement, right? As long as the actor is standing up straight and looking straight ahead, I don't have to touch, you know, their, their, you know, in between their legs because it, it, it's not necessary to do that. You just hand the tape measure to the actor and let the actor do that, right? I think that's the best way to do it. That's great. And there's a, a different person, but a little bit of a, a follow up here. When the question is, how do you tell your customer that you are uncomfortable in an article of clothing? And I think to add on to that, if you're uncomfortable in a particular fitting moment, but then also if a particular piece of clothing is not comfortable to you, how do you communicate that to, in your opinion, to a customer? Yeah, tell me in the fitting, right? If, if something makes you feel uh, vulnerable or uncomfortable, or if it's too revealing, or if you're just not comfortable with it at all, let me know. Tell me in that moment, because then I can provide more context to say, yeah, I know it's a little revealing, but don't worry, we're planning to raise that so your bust won't be show, your cleavage won't show, or yes, I see that it's tight too. Don't worry, if we can't make this dress larger, then we will find something else. But it's, it's important for me to know what the actor's comfort level is in the fitting, rather than two days before opening, you know, don't try and tough it out if you think, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll just, I'll just get courageous and I'll just, you know, let my boobies fly, you know, don't, don't do that. Like, let me know, let me know in the fitting 
if you're feeling uncomfortable. You know, I think all customers would want to know sooner rather than later so that they can make that change. If you're if you don't feel like you're being heard in the moment at the fitting, then it's okay to go back to rehearsal and have a conversation with your stage manager or your um, or or your director or um, the the actor the actor rep uh, representative in in the in the cast. Uh, but most costume designers will be sympathetic to your plight and will want to correct the issue right away. Great. Um, a separate question. Do your actors rehearse in period shapewear, i.e. corset, hoops, boots? Uh, it depends on the show. Uh, we, uh, at Brooklyn College, we have, we have uh, a stock of corsets and, and we have some corsets that are kind of trashy that we set to one side specifically for rehearsal. So we have some corsets that are already beat up. You know, some of them are a little bit more like, like cor they're not like traditional corsets, they're more like fashion corsets. So we send those to rehearsals so that the actor gets the sense of what it's like to wear a corset. We generally don't release the, the show garments uh, until uh, tech and dress uh, because corsets, as, as you may know, are quite expensive uh, to buy. They're quite labor intensive to build. So uh, without having a wardrobe attendant there to cinch you in properly, we generally don't release them to rehearsal. But I do encourage actors to have a set of your own rehearsal garments. So, so what that means is for, for women, make sure you have a pair of uh, character shoes, make sure you have a rehearsal skirt or a variety of rehearsal skirts, depending, you know, on the volume of skirt that you might be tasked with wearing, right? Uh, for, for men, or, or actually it doesn't matter men, women, it, it's gender neutral because, you know, women and men are playing all different kinds of roles these days, right? So it, it's probably good to have all of these things. I would say for male roles, you should probably have hard-soled shoes, um, a tie, a hat, a vest, uh, and, a, and a jacket, like a sport jacket. Um, any of those things will work for any particular time period. Really, the idea is to just give you a sense that you've got something on that does provide a little bit of restriction of movement and remind you to move in a particular way. So, so if your costume shop or your costumer can't provide those things for you, um, then seek them out yourself. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be expensive. You can go to a thrift store and just get something that help, whatever it is that helps you have the sense of that period and style and that character. Great. Um, and there was one last comment, but it was um, a, a thank you from uh, the, their, it's, the round table is fantastic and he really appreciates your answers. Um, Great. So I, I think if you, we have 15 minutes, Elaine and Deb, um, I wanted, if, if it's all right, I wanted to talk a little bit about the collaboration aspect. Is that okay? Um, yeah. But I'm gonna be very brief so that there, cause right now there are no questions, but when questions come in, I'm gonna move the questions to you too. Um, but Elaine had mentioned the five C's with the, um, the consent, communication, context, choreography, and closure. I would like to add that the, uh, the C of collaboration, which because Elaine and I have worked in um, collaboration with the last live show we were able to do here at CMU <laughs> back in February. Um, punk Rock, which is by Simon Stevens, if people um, are not aware of it. He is the uh, playwright of Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. And this play, Punk Rock, is a very intense um, play about adolescence and ultimately um, a violent act that takes place because of the pressures of academia and family and, and all of those things. And you find out through the play, there's, there's bullying going on, there's horrific language used from um, character to character. But of course, those are actors that have to say those words. Those are actors that have to do those things on stage. And early on, my, I reached out to Elaine and I said, uh, as the director reading the play, um, a little terrified of how I'm going to keep my cast healthy and and um, at their at their artistic and creative 
peak, you know, so they can do the work they need to do, honor the text and protect themselves. Um, because some of the language and some of the name calling that has to take place and the actions that have to take place are, are truly horrific. And I reached out to my colleague, Elaine, and I said, hey, this intimacy thing, um, because I didn't know a lot about it, but yes, she, she is, you know, she's a big proponent and had talked a lot about it. And I have a fight choreography. I mean, that's what I do as well as direct. So the language made sense to me, the idea of choreographing difficult things like fights and sword fighting and things like that. I, I understand. I wasn't quite sure how it was going to work, but I trusted my colleague. And this is a really important aspect of the collaboration between a director and an intimacy director and when they come together or an intimacy choreographer, whatever title we'd like to use, the trust there is very important. And because a director, you know, you're responsible for so many different things, but you wanna make sure that you trust the people that you're working with. And Elaine, I trusted implicitly and brought her on board. And she, I believe trusted me in turn so that the two of us, as we trusted each other through this process with communication in the audition posts, with the character breakdown, letting people know, make sure you read this play. You have to know what those characters are saying to each other, what they are called to do to each other. And if you're not okay with that, please don't, don't get involved with this because we wanna protect you and your mental health. So when we did that, and that came from Elaine, then we did that, Elaine had a whole, um, sheet of information that was available that we did in our very first read through. Um, and even before that, they had to, when they looked at their audition um, form, they signed it and said, yes, I have read this play. These are the characters I am comfortable auditioning for. And if there were any characters they were not comfortable auditioning for, they were allowed to circle those and we would not consider them. And then the very first day of rehearsal, Elaine was there. We had uh, a closed rehearsal and I, I don't usually do that but this was important to to create that trust between the cast between stage managers assistant directors my dramaturg everyone in there no phones no pictures none of the conversations of things outside of the the rehearsal hall we would um do our tag in at the end of the evening we developed through elaine's help a tag out so that everything ideally was working so that those students could do this very difficult play which inc includes gun violence and death on stage and very very painful things that they had to deal with but in a healthy way so that theater can be healthy and and you could do this show for eight times a week you know in a professional setting and protect yourself and i think the trust that elaine and i had the ability to collaborate the students saw because i would turn my rehearsal over to her and say you you know it's elaine's turn and and very careful to never undermine each other like accidentally like well no i thought oh well let me check with elaine as opposed to mm, you know but that never really came to that because we had open communication all the way through and that's an important aspect because if you're going to have an intimacy director choreographer on a show directors might balk at that and go wait where is the line and i think you develop that line in conversations with each other um and I see a lot of questions coming up. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so thank you to Elaine for that wonderful experience. Um, thank you to you. Um, great, um, because I cannot imagine doing that show and the content of that show without, because intimacy is not just kissing and right. holding. It is that being able to call someone whatever awful word is in the text yeah. and then let it go by the end of rehearsal and be able to leave that, not carry it home with you. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you are addressing intimacy in our wonderful post-COVID world, um, i.e. keeping folks safe and healthy, still getting work done, et cetera? That's our first question that's coming up here. I don't know who would want to take that. Maybe Elaine. Um, but it's, what's interesting to me is that because when we think of intimacy, we think of physical contact most often. Um, it feels in a lot of ways like intimacy has been shut down. Um, and certainly I have felt that after studying this for several years and then being told, never mind, your actors have to be six feet away from each other. So that, that has been challenging. Um, I think that this whole, this whole sh um, shutdown and separation has 
allowed a lot of us to reassess what is intimate for us because we've been so physically separated. I, I really think that when we start to come back together, there is going to be a heightened sense of contact in the smaller interactions. And I think that that might play out sort of across the board in theater that the less is more might, might be the thing for a while. Um, because even when we're, when we're called back, please soon, man, like this is, um, I think there's still going to be hesitation. There's still going to be, of course there is. We're going to carry the weight of the past six months into that rehearsal space with us. And I think that one of the most important things as we get back to physical intimacy, to that physical contact, is to hold space for everything that we're bringing in along with our eagerness to get back to work, which might be fear and hesitation and uncertainty. And I think that that's probably going to have to be part of the initial communication is setting aside some time to to air those issues and to make sure that everyone is understood and in where they're coming from um i know that deb can talk about costuming intimacy yeah. stuff it's it's going to be an adjustment i think but yeah. you know even even now we're working on digital theater productions and even though i'm not having in person fittings i'm having zoom fittings so so at the start of our zoom fittings i always ask the actor do i have your permission to see you in your private space are you okay with me viewing you like cuz all of you can see my private space right i'm giving you permission to see me in my private space, right? And if, if an actor is not comfortable, then it's not going to be a good fitting, right? So, so even in this environment, it's okay to ask for consent. That's great. There is a question. Um, it's very interesting. I'm not sure. I know that I don't have experience with this, but maybe we can, we can, um, uh, just think about it out and figure it out. The, there was a mention of closed rehearsals. I, I mentioned that just a moment ago and only having the few, and so did you, Aline, earlier, having, only having the few necessary people for the scene in the rehearsal. In those scenes with people under 18, what about parents who might insist on also being in the room? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? My thought on that is that if you are working with minors, and in some way, the minors are involved in the intimacy. Again, disclose, disclose, disclose. And make sure that before you cast a minor, you have the consent of the guardian to do so with their full understanding of the expectation of that role. Um, that being said, even if I sign a piece of paper and say, my child can be in your show and do the things necessary. I still may want to be in the rehearsal and be monitoring what's going on with my child. I would, I would not deny a guardian entrance to a closed rehearsal with a minor. If we get into that rehearsal and it turns out that the guardian is, you know, the hovering stage parent, then we need to have some open communication with the parents about what is and isn't productive. And that if they want to be, you know, a watchful eye in that space and be looking out for the physical and mental well being of their child, great, you're welcome here, absolutely be here. If you are here to comment and undermine the director or get engaged in the scene work, that is not what you're here for. So I think that it comes down to disclosure, it comes down to being aware of who is responsible for that minor, and then also being willing and able to speak openly to that guardian. Yeah, that makes sense. Because especially here at the university, like when we did Shrek, when the, you know, there are, there are, there are a lot of um, very important steps you have to take to, to cast a minor in the professional theater and at the, the university level, you know, they have their own um, things to to make sure the boxes are checked and the parents are communicated with and part of that loop um, 
the idea of a parent being there. And that makes sense, Elaine, so that the parent can be there and supportive. Always there's, there's someone who has been, had a background check. Right. The, um, the, a, a child, act, someone under 18 cannot be, at least at the university level, cannot be in a rehearsal without one of those. And usually it's stage manager, ASM, director, assistant director, um, some other select um, cast members who've gone through background checks and who are always with that minor. But then parents, you know, I know I was, I never didn't allow parents in. Um, but I think that you're right. If there were problems that came up, there needs to be further conversation um, in that. Uh, no questions at the moment. And it's 7.59. What about that? On target. <laughs> Pretty good. So was there anything, Lane, that you wanted to say or Deb to, to sum up, conclude that um, takeaway thing? To, to sum up, it's a lot of information. Mm -hmm. I know it's a lot of information and it might uh, feel sort of overwhelming to undertake. And it might feel like it's too much and it's too new and, you know, whatever, whatever that is. I, I will say this, though. You don't have to make sweeping changes. You don't have to incorporate every single thing we talked about. If all you do is decide today that you are going to disclose action expectations at audition postings, great. You've already done some great work. <laughs> you have already made a great decision. You have opened the lines of communication. You have created transparency that wasn't there before, that's a, that's a great step to take. That's a positive step in the right direction. Um, I think that a lot of this, and Keely was talking about it in collaboration, but I think that a lot of this comes down to leaning on colleagues, collaborators, you know, creative friends who have different skill sets and going into it, you know, without your ego and saying, I think that if I bring this from my skill set and this from yours, we'd be unstoppable. <laughs> and <laughs> you right. need to be able to, you need to be able to do that. And if you can lean into collaboration, so much the better. I encourage you to look for workshops. There are a whole lot of them happening online through um, IDC and through TAI and through other organizations that can take you through the basics um, and, and just sort of get you, get you situated where you need to be. Um, theatrical intimacy, their, their official motto is um, ethical, efficient, effective, but their t-shirts and buttons say better is better. And that is the truth. Baby steps are better than no steps. So it's important to take the information and decide you're going to be better. Um, in the workshop that I went to with Tonya Cena a couple of years ago, after she talked about the pillars, she said that she thinks that there might be another one, another C pillar, which is change. And what she meant by that is when you know better, you have to do better. It's your obligation. So there really is no going back. <laughs> it's something that once you see it, you can't unsee it. And once you see the need for the work, you can't unsee the need for the work. That is very true. I don't know, Elaine, if you saw in the, in the Q&A, you were sort of addressing the question, how, do they, how does one become an intimacy director? Where do they go to get certified, get started? So right now, everything is sort of on hold. Um, IDC is just opening up, uh, maybe next week. I'm trying to think of what I saw online a couple of days ago. Um, they're just opening up their level one sessions again. They've been doing sort of 90 minute webinars and, um, s subject specific webinars over, over this several month period, but their certification process has been on hold. And that is going to start opening up again, I believe. So check out um, Intimacy Directors. Their, their website is IDC Professionals. Um, the material that will come to you from this, the, the Google Slides, 
The last one that's on there that we didn't look at today is a resources page and it has the link for theatrical intimacy, for intimacy directors, um, for the Chicago Theater Standards, Not in Our House, which is really the first, Chicago is really the first city to unite and create documentation that the theaters were going to abide by in order to um, reduce harassment in the theater. So that's a great resource too. Um, but IDC is the group that is doing certification right now. IDI UK, uh, which is overseas, is also doing certification if you, you know, you have the luxury of travel. <laughs> um, but those are the places to start. Great. Um, so I know we are close to time. Um, JR might be coming on to kick us off. Um, but Deb, was there anything that you would like to say? I would like to thank both Elaine and Deb for all of the information that you've put out here in the conversation, answering questions, putting um, a very important topic out um, for conversation and an examination. Um, it's been my absolute pleasure to, to be here and share with all of you. Um, if there are costumers or wardrobe folks out there who have uh, further questions or want to talk about things more, please reach out to me. I'm at Brooklyn College. I'm pretty easy to find or I'm sure you can get my email from the folks here, but definitely reach out. I'm happy to happy to take other questions or uh, find resources or point you in the right direction. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been great. I'm really happy to share and um, I hope I hope this information has been really helpful for all of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. Thank you to everyone. We're at 805. I don't know if we've been cut off yet. <laughs> right. Nobody's but, um, listening anymore. Yeah. We're just talking. There you are. Not, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, want to thank you so much uh, for being the conduit of that change uh, that's happening. Um, it is fantastic for you guys to share your knowledge, your expertise. I, I think everything that you delivered tonight was, was not only uh, informational, but attainable. Uh, and I, I love the fact that you're wrapping up talking about, you know, now that we know the knowledge, now it's our responsibility to be better about it. And then not just for ourselves, but now we have to take that teaching role uh, and we have to model that for everyone that's going to be involved from this point forward. Um, I know as we set these up, I really encouraged all of the, the directors uh, and production managers that I'm aware of. You know, I love the tie-in with the costuming uh, as well, obviously such an important level. Uh, and thank you so much for, uh, I, I know some of the attendees talked about involvement of youth or minors, so very important. Uh, there's very few of us involved in theater that have not participated or supported youth theater in some way. Mm -hmm. So such a wonderful message. Um, I, I couldn't be happier. I was grateful when you, uh, when you guys all agreed, uh, so grateful when um, uh, JR shared with me the lineup. So again, I want to extend my thanks from uh, CTAM uh, and from JR. He's having some computer issues at the moment, so he wasn't able to wrap things up for you guys today. But, but Keely, Elaine, Deb, thank you so much for sharing everything you did. I, I mean it when I say you guys are definitely the conduit of this change that's about to happen with all of these theaters. So I really do appreciate it. I want to let our attendees know that, that we will make available a video copy of this on our website, ctam.online. And I would also uh, love to hear a little bit of your feedback. Uh, we would like to collect that. As an attendee, you have the ability to raise your hand virtually uh, on your end of things. And if you'd like uh, to stay after the webinar for just a few moments, uh, I can activate your camera and your microphone. And we'd like to hear a, a little bit of uh, maybe a positive takeaway. Uh, or what you think you can bring to your group. Mm -hmm. uh, and for those attendees still with us, I also wanted to remind you, you know, that we do have more webinars and roundtable discussions throughout the week. If you haven't signed up for them, go to CTAM online and sign up for them today. Ladies, thank you so much. Really thank appreciate you. everything you. you brought.